What is happening, everybody? And welcome to episode number 47 of RizzoCast. And we are pleased to be joined today by none other than an all-star 1997, played parts of 13 seasons at the big league level. He's now an analyst covering the Giants at NBC Sports Bay Area. It is former Southpaw Sean Estes. Sean, how are you doing? Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Um, well, I couldn't be any better, to be honest with you. I was up all night with a sick kid throwing up. Uh, stomach flu. Um, running on fumes today, which is when I do my best work. So um, I think we're in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> Love to no, hear I'm, you. I'm, I'm actually doing really well. The, the weather's beautiful. I'm outside in Arizona where I live. Um, spring training is in full swing right now and just down the street from me. So I'm excited about baseball being back and, um, started about the giants this year and, and what we can look forward to. Yeah. Spring training is back. You're right. So what was this time of year kind of like for you? Would, you know, was the, were you ready to go back? Was it like, Oh, one more week? I'm sure, I'm sure you were ready, but what was kind of spring training like for you as a player this time of year? Yeah, well, so when I was younger, it was I, I can't wait to get to, to spring training, and and usually there was always something to prove. Um, you're trying to make a team, you're trying to move up the ladder in the minor leagues. You get to the big leagues and you, your first big league camp, and then you know you want to prove to them that that uh, that you belong there. Uh, there's a lot more to prove when you're younger, so you're chomping at the bit to to get to spring training. Plus, the off season's just way too long, based on the fact the minor league season gets done in September, so you have a full another month that you have to sit around or work out or whatever it is. So it becomes a little bit monotonous. And then as you start to get older and you get settled in, you know, you're going to be on the team and your perspective changes when it comes to spring training. And it's all about just getting ready for the season. You kind of know exactly what it takes to do that. Um, and then you realize that spring training is a little too long. <laughs> the, the off season's too short. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I would say that, you know, it, the, it, you know, when I got to the big leagues and I, I was established, I felt that um, I looked forward to the games of spring training. Um, I was excited just to get back and play baseball again. The off season is just perfect, depending on how late, late you go into the off, how late you go into a postseason run. Um, the off season is just the right amount of time where you can actually look forward to putting the glove back on again, getting back out there, putting the spikes on, hanging out with your teammates, getting in that clubhouse atmosphere, and uh, and and then really the excitement of just kind of seeing what what you what you have as a team. Um, you know, what you can accomplish as a team. And then obviously individually, you know, you set goals for yourself. So um, yeah, this was the time of year where like they, they just started games down here. So this is what you look forward to the first five or six days of spring training for pitchers and catchers is no bueno. It's uh, <laughs> it's a lot of pitchers fielding practice, uh, a lot of bunt plays, um, you know, a lot of running, uh, just you just can't wait for the the hitters to get there so you can do your first live batting practice sessions and then you obviously transition into games um, but yeah I, I think it just depends really on where you're at in your career about how you view spring training and how how um, forward you are you know you are looking forward to it I guess it's to say so when you retired uh, was there like an itch like an automatic itch the next spring like did you feel like I should be in spring training I should be in Arizona I should be in Florida was that like did that stay with you after you retired you know not really um, I know a lot of guys you know probably would tell you that it does um, and did it felt kind of weird come middle of February and you had nowhere to go um, and I think part partially why I didn't have that itch is because I, after my first, my last spring training in 2010 with the Nationals, where I was released and I knew that I was going to be done playing, um, I automatically transitioned to the next phase of my career, which is broadcasting. And I went and got an interview um, and uh, NBC, NBC Sports Bay Area to see, you know, where I could go in far as media is concerned. And then I got the job uh, the next year. So come this time, you know, my first year post-retirement, I dove right back into a little different line of work, but it was still like, you know, business as usual. It's baseball season. And now I got to prepare a different way. I got to prepare more mentally. I got to learn like the, the team. Um, I got I to find out how to become a better broadcaster. And instead of like trying to figure out how to get out um, Albert Pujols or uh, trying to figure out how to get out Gary Sheffield, 
Um, it was more about my preparation was like, okay, I, I got to go out and study these guys, find out what the roster is going to look like. And then I also have to prepare to get better on television, you know? So the mindset was a little bit different, but I never really felt like I had that spring where nothing was going on. And what am I doing right now with myself? You know, it is, it was, it's always been baseball in, in one um, aspect or another for me um, pretty much since I was 18 up until right now, I'm still doing the same thing broadcasting wise. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's funny. You, you said that you have nothing. You usually had stuff to do during the spring after you're tired. And here you are with a sick kid talking to me in 2021. So there you go. <laughs> So let's talk about the Giants. They're in a packed division. Uh, the Padres made a ton of moves, well-documented. The Dodgers are the Dodgers, one of the better teams, probably the best team and the favorite to win the World Series. Who knows what that means? Because you can't predict that kind of stuff most of the time. But they're, they're good. And the Giants are kind of that third team in the National League West. What is kind of your, what are you expecting in 2021 in terms of uh, impact some of the, you know we see the veteran players belt crawford posey they're kind of on their last year of their deal some of the young guys coming up what are some of your expectations for 2021 in san francisco yeah before i before i give you my expectations on a lighter note can you hear that dog barking in the background because mm -hmm. if you can then uh, then i'll go to a different spot because i don't want that going on the whole interview but if you can't um i'll get on to the um to the stuff about baseball Can you very vividly very vividly you're good i'm good okay cool all right because it's annoying me i hope it's not annoying you guys <laughs> uh yeah no i i i obviously you, you mentioned that the dodgers and the padres um on paper you know obviously the team to beat and, and coming from a media side of things uh that's all we can do right now is look at it on paper obviously track record speaks for itself with the dodgers and what they were able to accomplish last year padres were able to make playoffs um they made some big moves this past winter uh you know on paper they are, lo are locked and loaded and and to be honest with you i think that they are in a position to be good for a long time and maybe even this year overtake the dodgers are that good but you still have to go out and play the games and that's why as a player you step into that clubhouse the first day of spring training and you are aware of what's going on around you, yet you still believe. And if you don't, you shouldn't be in there. You still believe that your team can win no matter what. Like it doesn't matter how good the other teams are. A lot can happen in a 162 stretch game stretch, a uh, season stretch, I should say. Um, injuries can happen. Um, you know, if you feel like you have a competitive team and you have a competitive group of guys that, that are tugging from the same rope and really believe that they can get it done and you have the depth to be able to do it and overcome injuries and adversity along the way, you don't feel like that you can't win. And I guarantee if you go and you interviewed every guy in this giant uh, clubhouse um, where they feel like they're going to finish in the division, they're going to tell you number first. And if they don't, they need to go somewhere else because you really do believe that yeah you might uh your backs might be up against the wall a little bit that you may have to have a lot go your way um to to win but at the same time you still have to go out there and play the games um and, and you feel like you have a shot and a legitimate shot um based on now, I'm, now I'm, let me put on my media hat and on paper um you know it doesn't look great for the giants as far as winning the division um, or even probably being, you know, the first wild card team. I think that I think that that's going to come out of the NL West. Now you do have two wild cards that you that, that you can play with, but there's the Braves and the Mets that are really good over in the East. Cubs and the Cardinals are all, you know going to be good in the Central. Um, Brewers may surprise some people, but you know what? The Giants, I think, have a legit shot of, of sneaking into the playoffs um, and being a wild card team. Uh, I feel like that they have guys in place right now that are proven um they have guys that had really good years in a short season last year coming off of those years with a lot of confidence i believe as far as that as from an offensive standpoint i saw i saw this giant club hit better than i've ever seen them hit it in oracle and that's talking back in 2000 when i opened the club when i opened up that ballpark with the, with that team and that was probably the best offensive team i ever played on um, that the, the runs that were scored last year and the home runs that were hit at that ballpark, um, 
showed me that this is a lineup to be reckoned with and the at bats that they do put together and the pressure they put on the opposing pitcher from top to bottom um they're gonna go out there and and and, and give you tough at bats so i liked what i saw offensively and for the most part it's pretty much the same group of guys so then you got to turn your turn to the pitching and we've seen you know the giants and how they won world series championships now obviously timely hitting was a big part of it but it was really came down to the pitching came down to the starting pitching in the bullpen and, and the defense and i i think ultimately that's what's going to win you world series um, that's what's going to get you in the playoffs. And I really like the look of the rotation this year. They've got a lot more depth going into going into the season this year. Um, they have, a, I think, a bona fide ace at the top of the rotation in Kevin Gossman. I believe a bounce back year from Johnny Cueto because he just figures out a way to get it done. Um, you know, I like the sign with Anthony DiSclefani. Uh, I, I think that, you know, he had a down year last year, but I think that he's shown that his st stuff plays at the big league level. He can get strikeouts. He can have success at the big level. Woods proven himself. Um, he's funky from the left side. He gives you a different look with deception. Uh, Sanchez could be the wild card here. You know, I mean, if he can get back to old Sanchez, um, he's nasty. And he's another guy that like a Gossman last year, you know, hey, coming off of a little bit of a down year as a starter prior year. Um, but stuff is still there. Can we figure something out? Maybe with the pitching coach, maybe mechanically, can he get back and be healthy? He can be another dominant dude. And then we've seen Logan Webb show signs of being brilliant in the past couple of years. And then Tyler Beatty will come off the DL from Tommy John. There's another guy. And then there's a, there's a couple other guys. I mean, I'm, that's just to name seven, right. That, that have probably a chance to pitch in the rotation this year. And I like all those arms. And then the bullpen, that's a crapshoot, and I it just it's it, you never know. I mean, I think that they're they're positioned to be really really good in the bullpen. They have great arms. They have guys that give you different looks from both sides, righties, lefties, funk, um, good off speed stuff. Guys that have swing and miss sliders, have swing and miss fastballs. Um, they got a, a lot of different looks. You got a guy throwing, you know, dragging his knuckles on the ground, and Tyler Rogers. I mean, a lot of different looks that Gabe Kapler is going to be able to deploy um, on any given day or in time. So. Um, and they get, and they're deep and, and the triple a bullpen is going to be solid as well. And you, you've seen in the past, like there's just a lot of shuffling going on during the season, a lot of transactions being made based on guys pitching two or three days in a row. Okay. Then you go down to triple a, get somebody else. So do you have reinforcements at that level? Absolutely. So, um, what to expect win loss wise? I don't know. I think it's a better than 500 team this year. How, how much better? I don't know that. Uh, I don't think anybody knows. But I obviously you 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 know you see it, it's it, you see the guy the two the two stud teams in front of you which I believe are the two best teams in the National League and the and the Dodgers and the Padres you're gonna have to play them a lot this year matter of fact you're gonna have to play them oh let's see 13 26 times um, you know or more I mean I think you you got to play them nine 18 36 times total. So that's a lot of games against really good competition. Yet you do have the Diamondbacks and the Rockies in your division, which you get to play 36 times as well. So if you go 0-36 <laughs> against the Dodgers and Padres, and then you go 36-0 and against the other two teams, then you're 500 in your division. You got to just clean up on the other divisions. Simple, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that it's so interesting because the Dodgers are good, but the Giants have always played, or at least the last few years, have played the Dodgers pretty well. Last year, you know, besides like that opening night, I think the opening day, uh, and that one doubleheader, the Giants played pretty well against the Dodgers. So it's going to be interesting to see. I think the Padres, the Giants have not seen Blake Snell or um, any of those guys yet. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. And of course, Coors Field, you never know what to expect. So we can't wait to watch some National League West baseball for sure. So let's talk. I want to talk to you about the bullpens because you mentioned the bullpens and Tyler Rogers and, you know, a different different arm angle. Then you go to a guy like Matt Whistler, who's, you know, 86 percent slider. Then you go to a guy, Jake McGee, who's 86 percent fastball. I mean, it's all over the place. It's different, different looks, as you mentioned. I mean, bullpens used to be a thing where, you know, it used to be considered failed starters would get knocked to the bullpen and you used to want to get to the bullpen as an offense. When you watch baseball today, how taken aback are you by the power pitching in these bullpens? Well, it's just become normal now. I mean, 
we had Felix Rodriguez back in uh, 2000. Um, he was our hardest thrower coming out of the bullpen. Um, he threw even harder than Nen. Um, at that time, he was throwing 97, 98, sometimes 99. And all he would throw would be a fastball. And it had life to it. And at the time, that was one of the best fastballs I'd ever seen. Um, and the fact that he could just throw a fastball and get away with it. I always felt like that the only way you could survive at the big league level is if you had an off-speed pitch to go with it. He proved you didn't need to do that. As a matter of fact, his worst breaking ball he threw all year ended up getting knocked for a base hit against the Mets in the 2000 playoffs and uh, for a base hit up the middle because it gave the hitter time to hit it. Like, he, I mean, he, he did not need to throw an off-speed pitch um, and get guys out, and he was our setup guy. Now that's he's a dime a dozen. I mean, you, everybody you see that the opposing bullpens and even the Giants bullpen runs out there has the ability to throw up for 90s, it seems like. And and with that being said, yeah, it makes it a lot more difficult. It's not necessarily like let's get to the bullpen anymore. You know, unless you have a starter on the mound that is just dominant that day, it's it's like how are we going to how are we going to score runs today? It's not like let's get to the bullpen. It's like how are we going to get to the starter early? And then when the bullpen does come in, um, how are we going to grind out of bats and get guys on base and find a way to score some runs? Uh, you're not as giddy as an offense right now to, to see other other bullpens. And that's not saying that about all the bullpens, but, you know, the good bullpens. Yeah, you, you don't want you don't want to get to those guys. Um, and like you said, I mean, just the fact that these guys are coming in and throwing so hard now with that with 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 that being said, I think that hitters eyes now are adjusted to the velocity a little bit more so than they have in the past. Um, like I said, Felix Rodriguez coming in, throwing 97, 98. The hitters just didn't see that. So the, it looked a lot harder to them um, when they when he did come in the game. So they had to cheat for the fastball. Um, they had to make some adjustments. Now guys are so in tune to seeing that velocity that it doesn't phase them as much anymore because you have, say you have four, you see four guys out of the bullpen um, that day, but they're all throwing high nine, mid to high 90s. So you're already, your timing's already kind of there. Um, and if you see that day in and day out, it's not going to phase you. What does phase hitters, and if you talk to hitters, um, is deception, how fast they can pick up the baseball out of the hand of the pitcher. Uh, if a guy, and we always used to say, you know, that guy throws a hard 95, um, or, you know, he throws 98, but it just doesn't seem like 98. Maybe the gun's saying that, but I feel like I can see the ball. I can pick it up earlier, so I'm on time for it. But a guy that throws 95 that can hide the ball and has a little life to the ball, uh, maybe it actually has that effect that it takes off and it, it rises when it gets to the plate. Uh, those are the guys that are tough to hit. Um, and also a good breaking ball with good spin that looks like a fastball out of the hand of the pitcher that's hard to pick up that you – and, and a guy that does throw hard, then you can't necessarily time the fastball, but you have to time the fastball. But then all of a sudden you have a, a good spin on a breaking ball that, that disappears. Um, and a guy like, like you men and Whistler that can just throw that 85% of the time and get hitters to swing and miss or get weak contact. Um, that just goes to show you that I think it's changing a little bit as far as like how GMs are, are, um, are assembling their bullpens or getting guys now that have more, swing and miss breaking ball stuff to go with the velocity. It's not just, oh, yeah, it's a nice arm, but he doesn't really have a lot to go with the fastball. And one, he can't control or command a fastball. He can just throw hard. And that plays sometimes, but on a consistent basis, it's tough to get hitters out at the big league level. One, can't throw strikes with it. You fall behind in the count, and then you got to throw a 3-0 uh, ball right down the middle of the plate. And that's when the hitter is going to be ready, and they're going to tee off on it. So. Um, I like the look of the Giants bullpen just because, like you mentioned, uh, they're not predictable. They're not all throwing mid to upper 90s with nothing to go with it. They don't all have straight fastballs that and they and they don't they're not just velocity, no command guys. You know, guaranteed when spring training start or when the season starts, the guys in that bullpen will have to prove in spring training that they can throw the ball over the plate. You've already heard it. Uh, for Gabe Kapler from the um, the 40 man guy Nunez, you know, or not the 40 man guy that the rule five guy Nunez is that, you know, not only do we like his arm and he hasn't pitched above a ball, but he's already filling up the strike zone in spring training from day one in his bullpens against hitters live batting practice and then into his first game. He loved the way that he was throwing strikes with his fastball. 
they're going to have to do that to make this roster. So when it, when it, when they whittle it down to eight relievers come opening day, um, I think the Giants fans are going to love the look of this giant bullpen. Yeah. And I think I, I played four years of high school baseball. And the number one thing that I was told was no free nineties. No free. I mean, there's a time and place to walk a guy, but it's not leading off an inning. And I think, I mean, just I wish the... somebody would, I wish somebody would have told me that in <laughs> high school. I give, I gave too many free nineties in my career. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I wasn't going to mention that, man. I wasn't going to mention that. So I it just, just know that I it wasn't me that mentioned it. it. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, well, that, that leads me into this next point. Sean Estes in his prime, would he be able to play baseball in 2021? Would he be able to get big league hitters out? In my prime? Um, <laughs> I still feel like, I still feel like that. And maybe it's just a mindset, you know, and I know we're kind of joking around about this, but I felt that, uh, I felt that no matter what, like I could, I could pitch even like mm -hmm. when they told me I couldn't pitch at the big league level, I still felt that I could, as long as I was healthy, you know, I mean, obviously if you're dealing with injuries and you're in pain uh, and you can't execute pitches um, you can't. And that's why I, when I see a pitcher nowadays that is trying to pitch through an injury, I can tell right away, just based on the action of his pitches. I don't even have to see what his body language is. I can see what his pitches are doing if I've seen him at his best before. And I can tell you that there's something bothering him because he can't get extended. Um, he, uh, he doesn't have the same action on his fastball or his breaking ball. Um, so then that would be the case. If I'm not healthy, I can't, I would not be able to get big league hitters out right now. Now, if I'm healthy and I'm throwing 90, and I have my curveball to go with it and change up. Yes, I believe I could. Now in my prime, when I'm throwing 95 max, and with my curveball, my my 12 to six curveball and change up, um, yeah, without a doubt, I still believe that plays for sure. Um, the difference now is is that, and it might even be I don't want to say easier. I'd probably give up probably more home runs if I pitch nowadays. But who doesn't? But you strike uh, more I, guys I, out. I strike more guys out. Uh, I think the, the philosophies that are changing nowadays now it used to know like a hitter came up to the plate. If he was a very aggressive free swinger type of guy that you didn't have to throw a strike to, you know, that, that he would expand the strike zone in certain counts, maybe even from the get go, obviously Vladimir Guerrero stands out, but I mean, he was able to do it better than anybody hit, hit good pitches from pitchers out of the strike zone. Um, but he's, he, he's, uh, He's an anomaly with that stuff. But in general, like you used to know, I feel like now hitters are just a lot more, especially this Giants team, you know, and what they preach. And I think the good teams do it is just um, zone awareness, like swinging at pitches that you know that you can that you can do some damage with um, being and having having just better approaches at the plate, not swinging at a lot of garbage, you know, making sure that pitchers come to them. So I would have to be able to not only throw strikes consistently but be able to command not just a fastball but a breaking ball i never felt like i had to command a breaking ball i could just throw it up there now i feel like that i'd have to throw it to spots i'd have to i'd have to throw more four seam fastballs up in the zone which wasn't something that i that i that i could do very well i was more two seam keep it down keep it on the ground but the approach now is a little bit different obviously you'd have to make some adjustments to that which which i i would feel like i could do um, but yeah, I absolutely. I mean, if you don't, you don't put pitch in the big leagues, you know, and get there and then doubt, you know, your abilities to get hitters out no matter when and what era it's in. Like you felt you probably, you could talk to a guy that played in Willie Mays's era. If he could get guys hitters out nowadays and they would probably tell you, yeah, I'd find a way to do it no matter what my velocity would be. Yeah, for sure. So I want to ask you about, kind of the early part of your career when you, right after you were drafted, you know, there were some clunkers in the minor leagues as a first round pick. Did you ever, cause I know you had the, you had the commit, you had committed to play at Stanford. Was that ever in the back of your mind was like, was there ever a question of doubt that followed you through maybe those first few years of the minor league level? The only time I'd started to doubt myself was when, um, is when I was traded to the giants. Mm. Um, as bad as I was with Seattle, I never doubted that I would, that I was, that I could figure it out. I just, I, did, I didn't think it was going to take as long, right. I didn't feel like I was going to struggle as bad as I did, but 
the struggles I always felt there was a reason why it wasn't that I just wasn't good enough. I, I, I just, I knew that I had to figure some things out mentally and I had to figure some things out physically, mechanically to get myself in the right position. Um, and, but there was a point with Seattle, even like, I don't think I can do this on my own. Like I'm trying to figure this out on my own mentally and it's not working. And mechanically, I'm not able to repeat my delivery and throw a strike consistently. So I need someone to help me with that. Fortunately, they, they both, both those came along at the same time. And that was in the off season in 1994. And I'd already pitched and had an injury uh, for three and a half years in the minor league system for the Mariners. Um, and so uh, I went to instructional league in 94. I met with the, the mental guy with the, with the Mariners at the time, Gary Mack. I met with uh, Ron Romanek, who is a really good pitching mechanics guy in instructional league. And by with both with the combination of the mental and the physical and really like bearing down on that kind of stuff, I was able to like the, 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 the switch went on and the light went on and um, you know, the giants were the, were the team that were able to benefit from it because um, that was 1994 off season. And as if you, if you can remember, you probably weren't even born yet, but uh, <laughs> there there's uh, you probably done some research, a little bit of history, but that the, there was the strike that year. And so baseball um, didn't start until late in 1995. So um, I went to spring training, big league camp for like two weeks and then they sent me out, but I got traded two starts into that season from the Mariners to the giants. And so I felt that I was on the right path going into that 95 season, but Seattle was trying to do some different things at the big league level and they're trading, you know, they're making some trades to try to win that year. Um, and so the giants, the giants were the team, they were the, were the team was the team that benefited from the hard work I had put in the previous winter. But then I started to doubt, okay, now I don't have that security blanket anymore. Um, you know, being a first round pick now I'm, now I'm on the giants and they didn't, they have nothing invested in me. They had a Solomon Torres invested in me. And he was a guy that, um, that they felt they couldn't get it done on their club, you know? So, uh, you know, they, they liked what they saw in me. But I started, that was the first time I'm like, okay, I have now, now I'm on my own, right? Now I'm on my, now I got to prove myself to this club. And do I really, you know, do I have what it takes? Fortunately, I was in the right frame of mind, like I said, because of the, the work I had put in the previous winter. And if I hadn't, if I had been traded a year earlier, I don't know. I don't know if I would have been in the right place, frame of mind and Giants may have given up on me, right? I might, I might not have, have, have ever been pitched in the big leagues I don't know but I do know that that mentally and physically I was in a good place and um and as soon as I got my feet under me with the Giants organization and and just the initial shock of being traded and going to the minor leagues with them and meeting new guys and new coaches um as soon as that happened which was fairly quick I'd say probably four or five starts into it that's when my career took off and I went from low A to high A to double A to uh, September call up all in that same year in 1995 and then um, became, you know, a full-time giant 96. Pitching at Candlestick Park, because <laughs> I have to ask hitters, you know, we, the wind is always blowing out to right field. That's what we hear all the time. What was it like pitching there? I mean, as a, as a, as a starting pitcher um, was, was, the weather affecting you for the worst or was it affecting you for the better? Was it as bad as people say? Um, I know you don't want to say too much bad things about candlestick park or do you? So what was it like pitching at candlestick? Uh, pitching? I loved it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have anything negative to say about candlestick and that, and that's a place that I played in for par one, two, three, three and a half, almost four years. And, um, like I mentioned earlier about how your mindset changes when you're younger, as far as spring training goes, and then it evolves as you get older. That's kind of how it, it has to be with candlestick. I, I, I only endured it, you know, when I was younger. And fortunately, like looking back, I'm glad because had I been older and had to play there, it would have been a lot more difficult to pitch there based on the weather. Just your body, like as you get older, you start to have more aches and pains, you probably go through some injuries that, that, you know, you get arthritis. Um, 
you know, you stiffen up a lot easier. So like pitching in cold weather, you know, was a lot more difficult for me the older I got. When I was younger, like nothing bothered me. You know, I, I, I used it as an advantage. I thought it was more of a mental advantage to pitch in candlestick because I knew that the hitters um, were coming up to the plate. They were cold. They were more concerned about stuff out of their control than they were about getting a hit off of me. You know, I mean, at some point they probably, they, they, at some point they probably focused on that, but, but I, I leading up to that, nobody wanted to come into candlestick and play. They didn't like the cold. They didn't like the fact that they they had no clubhouse. Um, they had to go across the field into the right field bleachers to their clubhouse because it was an old football stadium. You know, I mean, we at least had a clubhouse where we could walk underneath um, from our dugout. It was underground to get to our club. They had to walk across the field. They had a little bathroom in their bullpen or in their dugout. The bullpen had to sit in the dugout. They were cold all game. I mean, it was a miserable place to play as a visiting player. I never had to do that, right? I was always on the home side. So I use it as an advantage. I loved pitching there. I felt the wind outside of it, you know, pop flies and fly balls, you know, uh, you know, the, the what ensued after that, you know, with guys running circles around the baseball. And I used to just get a kick out of other than when I was pitching, get a kick out of Glen Allen Hill in right field trying to catch a fly ball out there. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, but it was, it was a tough place to play defense, you know, because the wind would, would pick up around four every day. And then by the time the game hit, they you know, dry out the infield to get bad hops. We'd be in hard infield. Obviously the ball in the air, wind would swirl hot dog wrappers all over the place. I mean, I, I was pitching at one point. I remember it happened a couple of times and it was gusty winds. It wasn't just a consistent wind. All of a sudden it would be, it would be like 15 mile an hour winds. All of a sudden it'd be like a 40 mile an hour gust. And it'd be right in the middle of your windup. And you've heard stories about guys getting blown off the mound, literally, well, not necessarily blown off the mound, but like, you know, pitching without boring people, but in your pitching mechanics, you got to get to a balance point before you go home to the home plate. Well, if the wind was that gust came up and it blew from behind, it would literally push you forward to where you couldn't get to your balance point and you'd have to rush to home plate. And typically you'd, you'd end up throwing a bad pitch. Um, so it, it made it really difficult, but I always felt that it was an advantage just from a mental standpoint. Um, especially I, I didn't feel like, I felt like that if I could keep the ball on the ground, um, that it made life a lot easier. If I could strike some guys out, obviously it would make life a lot easier. And I had, I was fortunate that I was able to play or pitch and candlestick when I was young, I was strong and maybe a little bit naive to what was going on out there. You know, I mean, um, when I got into that new ballpark, I kind of realized, oh, this, this is like, this is the big leagues, right? This, now you're in this, you know, brand new ballpark. You got a packed house every night. The place is electric. Um, the, the amenities were, were just crazy nice. So yeah, when I had to compare the two, obviously, you know, you know, candlestick was what it was, but um, I'd never traded in, man. Uh, that's where I made my, my debut. I didn't make my debut there, made it in Pittsburgh, but I made my, you know, major league debut with the giants and um, got to pitch in candlestick um, in a ballpark where it was my first game I ever watched as a kid was in candlestick. So it was, it was definitely a came full circle and a dream come true. And then we swapped to the new ballpark. Of course, I think, you know, the first big, moment in the new ballpark was the JT snow game tying home run and the, the 2000 NLDS against the Mets. That was oh, the it first. Wasn't the, it wasn't the Kevin Elster three home runs. Opening day. <laughs> that, that See, wasn't the... <laughs> I wasn't even born yet, but I do my due diligence. I do my due diligence. So you, you have an interesting story of where you were during that home run, uh, during the, the JT snow home run. What were you doing when that happened? Yeah. Interesting. It was more depressing <laughs> to say the least. Um, yeah, no, I was in the clubhouse with my with my foot, ankle, um, in an ice bucket. Yeah, uh, in the training room. Not 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 the ideal place to be, but um, it was still exciting nonetheless. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a one of the most exciting games that I witnessed. Unfortunately, I had to witch, witness it, you know, from you know watching on, from the training room watching it on TV. But just I, you know. TV has a little bit of a delay. So, you know, you don't normally hear the crowd when you're in the clubhouse and in the training room, but 
there was like a um a vibration that that went down like that i felt in that training room um when he hit the home run and i the pitch hadn't even been thrown yet on tv so i knew something had happened and uh you know sure enough you know five second delay later you know jt hits the home run and uh and then i knew why um but that place was loud i mean and uh it was special. I mean, it's what's unfortunate about the whole thing outside of the fact that I had to watch it from the training room and um, I had blown out my ankle earlier on in that game at second base, but was that we lost that game. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's the buzz kill about the whole thing. I mean, my goodness. I mean, when you hit a home run like that, you're supposed to win. The momentum's on your side. I mean, and, and you get the last at bat. Oh man. It just, it was so deflating you know, the next inning when we went out there and, and they ended up getting a run. Um, and that's what I was talking about earlier when Felix Rodriguez, I mean, he was pitching that game and Daryl Hamilton, who was a giant 97, 98, he had a double down the line with two outs. And um, I think it was actually on a slider, but then the worst pitch was the slider. He threw to Jay Payton who came up next and, you know, Jay had Jay wouldn't have been able to, to catch. He was a good fastball hitter, but Felix had a different kind of fastball. It didn't matter if you had a, if you could hit a fastball or not. Um, you couldn't hit his. And, you know, that's where scouting reports sometimes bite you in the butt is the fact that, you know, Jay was a good fastball hitter. So Felix felt like he had to throw him a slider and it, it really sped up his bat and he was able to get a base hit up the middle and scored Hamilton from second base with two outs. And they ended up winning the game by a run. Uh, but not it doesn't take anything away from the moment in time that JT hit the home run off of Benitez because uh, we didn't know if it was fair or foul. You know, JT's, you know, running down the line, takes a wide turn, he's pointing, and all of a sudden it goes out. He came in to pinch hit that game, too. He didn't even start that game, so he came off the bench and hit that big home run for us. So what's unfortunate is that was probably – that was the best Giants team I played on. Uh, and we felt like going into that postseason that we had a chance to go all the way, um, you know, and, and, and that game really, in my opinion, is what, um, you know, if we win that game, we, we definitely win that series because we went, we would go up two zero and then go into Met in New York and only have to win one. Um, but now we're, now we split and it was such a huge like letdown you know, that when we went into New York, they had all the momentum in the world. And uh, we threw together an epic game in game three. I think it went 13 innings and Agbayani hit a home run. We'd lose that game late on a walk off. And then Bobby Jones almost no hits us the next day. And that was, that put a fork in us. But, um, but yeah, that was probably a defining, one of the defining moments for that opening year in, in uh, at the time it was packed Bell. So, and then a few years later, you get dealt to the Mets and there's a lot of people that rem uh, remember you by what happened with the Roger Clemens situation. And I feel like baseball has a way of policing themselves, uh, you know, and, and the players police themselves, I should say, would that kind of thing happen? Cause in, in case, I guess you could explain what happened with the Mets and, and when Roger Clemens came back after hitting Piazza in the head, tell me about that situation in New York. Yeah, I'll, I'll give I, it, it is a long story and I've told it a bunch and it can get mm -hmm. really long winded, but I'll, I'll probably I'll keep it. I'll, I'll try to tighten it up. Um, yeah, Clemens hit Piazza in 2000 in the head, didn't apologize or if he did, Piazza didn't didn't thought it was on purpose, whatever. And then they had the World Series that year in 2000 and then uh, Piazza's bat breaks in an at bat right. against Clemens and then Clemens picks up the bat head and throws it at Piazza and said he thought it was the ball. There was obviously some bad blood between Piazza and Clemens, two superstars in that era. Um, and then fast forward to 2002, um, I'm on the Mets. Clemens is pitching against the Mets at Shea, so he has to hit. Um, the talk was leading up to that game or the previous year because Clemens was supposed to pitch at Shea in 2001, and he came up with an injury prior to that game. So he didn't pitch at Shea, but he ended up pitching at Yankee Stadium, but he didn't have to hit. So now he has to hit. He can't duck it twice if that was what he was doing. And um, I'm on the mound. So, you know, the media 
which I wasn't really aware of it until they brought it up to me. I was watch I watched the World Series in 2000, obviously, and um, but I didn't know that that there were still lingering effects from that. I thought it had been handled already, but apparently it hadn't. And you know the way baseball is, you police it on the field. So, and there'll be a time and a place for everything. So this was the time and this was the place for Clemens to get, uh, for Piazza to get his revenge. But, um, but I had to be the guy to do it. <laughs> so, lucky me, right? And and I, you know, let me preface this by saying, like, you know, I'm not on that team in 2000, so I don't feel the emotions that that it went through um, that club, that bullpen, or that dugouts heads and and you know had i been on that team i probably would have felt a lot different about the situation but i felt that it was something that should already been handled um with piazza you know that was, you know it's really not my fight to, to fight but um i'm on the mound and if piazza wanted me to hit him or throw at him then then i would do it but nobody said anything to me for four days leading up to the start and i had teammates coming up to me telling me not to worry about it just go out you know playing the Yankees or best team in baseball like just go out if, you, if you're more focused if you're focused on that you're not gonna be able to help the team win a game you know it's gonna it's gonna consume me so I did I just focused on what I needed to do to get the Yankee lineup out and when the time came I, I do what I needed to do but like just before I went out to the mound that day um, Bobby Valentine called me into his office he was our manager and Piazza was in there and it pretty much said this is the sign you know to if we're gonna throw at him if the situation calls for it, we're going to do it. So nobody was on base. And then, and first time he came up and I knew I had one shot to do it and I reached back and I fired it and it, and it went behind him and he moved out of the way. And, and then I'm like, crap, that might've been my only shot to do it. Um, and I didn't get the sign again to hit him, but I, that's what I said. I, I said, if I get the sign to hit him, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, I'm not going to like be, I'm not going to just throw at Clemens just to throw at him. You know, like I said, I'll do it if it's called from the dugout and I'll do it. If Piazza walked out to the mound and said, Hey, throw it Clemens until you hit him. Let's just get this over with. But that never, that never was said. So I, I just pitched my game and, um, and uh, I ended up coming up later on in the game against Clemens and I ended up hitting, hitting a home run, which I thought was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what people remember is the fact that I missed him with the pitch, but then I didn't miss the pitch <laughs> yeah i ended up, hit, I ended up hit, hitting a home run and, and you know ended up pitching probably the best game of my of my of the year that year for them i didn't have a great year with the mets at all but that was probably the best game i pitched i mean i went seven scoreless and i think i punched out 11 and i hit a home run off of clemens so it was a it was a bittersweet day for me because i'm you know i'm on i'm riding a pretty good high after the game but then everybody wants to talk about, you know, the fact that I didn't hit him with the pitch, which, you know, whatever. I'll, I'll let them. I, I, I didn't lose any sleep over it, put it that way. Um, and then later on, coincidentally, we had a, uh, a Mets and a, a Yankee party that night uh, at, a, at, a, at this club in, in, in downtown New York. There was a friend um, of Clemens, coincidentally, and in uh, one of our pitchers in the bullpen, Mark Guthrie. And uh, we had this organized prior to the game, even that whoever wanted it to come can come. And Jason Giambi, who I had known from the A's days, A's Giants, um, and I got to know Jason a little bit. And he's the first person I saw. And he came up, gave me a big hug. He's like, hey, man, don't worry about that. He's like, even if you would have, you know, hit Clemens, the Mets fans wouldn't have been happy with that. They, they wanted, they hated Clemens so much based on what he did to Piazza that they would have wanted him like hit in the head, blood coming out of his ears. And they wanted, they would like wanted him coming off, off, carried off the field on a stretcher. Right. That's how like, so he's like, you wouldn't have, he's like, you couldn't have won. Cause I know that you're not going to do that. Right. You don't, you know, you're not going to hit a guy in the head on purpose and try to end his career, but that's what the Mets fans wanted to see because that's what happened to Piazza. Right. Um, so he said, he's like, to be honest with you, he's like, if you would ask Roger, you know, what he would have rather have had done, he would have rather been hit by the pitch, you know, and taken his base than you hit a home run off of him. So he said, I think you got him. I think you, you're one up. Yeah, you had three victories in that game. You threw at him, you pitched a great game, and you went deep off him. So I would say that's a pretty good win. Um, yeah, well, two out of three, you know, that's still a pretty yeah. good day. That's still pretty good average. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Had, um, I had, hit, had I had hit him when I tried to, 
the one time, pitched a great game and hit a home run, that that would have been epic. Yeah, I, I just think it's it's comical that you're not part of anything that happened in 2000. You're not part of anything that happened in 2001. And then here you are getting stuck in the middle of the situation. That's pretty funny. Uh, so real quick about Tommy John surgery. I know your road back was a little bit more interesting than some of the most Tommy John surgeries we see. And the challenges we hear about um, are serious. I mean, it's a, it's a big time procedure and it's crazy how many pitchers and young pitchers are getting it. And, you know, I, I've read stuff where it disgusts me that, that teenagers want to get it. And it's, it's unbelievable to me that that's the case. So what was kind of your road back? How did you know, did you, you know, did you know that you tore your UCL when you tore it? What was kind of the process there with Tommy John surgery? Yeah, no, I never had an elbow issue issue my whole career. I mean, every once in a while it would get tight, stiff, and I and I get some treatment on it, uh, but nothing ever that prevented me from pitching. Like I never missed a start because of it or anything. And then in spring training of 2006, I'm with the um, the Padres, and I'm um, having a great spring. I'm throwing the ball hard. I mean, I was really excited about the season and what I could do that year. And I was pitching a game against the Mariners, and I'll never forget. Um, I was facing a lefty. And I threw a fastball away to him and I felt like just a little tug in my elbow. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a sharp pain. It wasn't like, um, you know, like you hear about some guys that just, they just blow it out and they know right away and they try to throw another pitch and, and all, the ball goes over the backstop. It wasn't like that at all. I ended up finishing the game, um, ended up finishing that inning and pitching another inning after that. And then that night I came out of the game and just nothing, it didn't feel quite right in my elbow, but it didn't, it didn't hurt. And then um, after the adrenaline wore off and I, you know, I always iced my elbow and iced my shoulder after I pitched and after all, everything kind of like the adrenaline wore off and, and I got the feeling back in my elbow and shoulder from the ice. Um, then my elbow started to like to, to get, it felt stiff and we were leaving spring training. That was my last start of the spring. And we were leaving the next day to Vegas to play in an exhibition series in Vegas before the season started. And I went out to play a catch and um that's when the pain like I felt the pain in my elbow like pretty pretty significant pain um and it just wouldn't get loose and I couldn't throw the ball from you know 90 feet and I was playing catch with with my 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 catch partner and I just I I, I can't I can't do this I gotta go go to the trainer and see what's up so I went in and told him about it and they put me on some anti-inflammatories gave me some treatment because I was supposed to pitch the second game of the season that year and um, it was against the Giants. And, uh, and we had a rain out on the day I was supposed to pitch in San Diego. And so I had an extra day. So I went through in the bullpen, um, played catch that day. I remember of the rain out. And I remember playing catch thinking like, I don't, something's not right in my elbow. Like it hurts. And uh, I'm going to go. I said, um, I told myself, I'm going to go try to go out and pitch tomorrow and see how I do. And um I warmed up for that game and it hurt to throw a curveball so so bad that I was like, and it didn't hurt as bad with a fastball and a changeup. So I'm like, I guess I'm just going to go out there with two pitches and try to get it done. And uh, it worked out for like five innings. You know, I don't think I gave up a run through five on, and I didn't throw one curveball. And, uh, and then like, I think the sixth inning came around, I was pitching against Matt Morris and it was a zero zero game. And I, I think I walked a guy, gave up a hit or something. And, then I'm like, I was facing the lineup, I think maybe the third time I'm like, I got to throw some curveballs, or I'm going to get just, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to get knocked out of this game. And that that's when I start when I started throwing curveballs, that inning went really long. Um, and I finished the inning, gave up a couple runs and came in and uh, told the pitching coach, I think I blew out my elbow. Like I, I knew, like, like I said, it, the pain was so much that like, I could not, after they came out of that inning, I couldn't like go up and take my hat off it hurt and then I tried to shower after the game I couldn't even wash my hair so I went in the next day and got an MRI and sure enough I had a torn UCL um but they didn't know the significance of it so I tried to rehab it like you see that happen quite a bit um and then when I came back like I think a month or two later and tried to throw a bullpen and throw a curveball again it was a curveball that got it it wasn't the fastball or changeup that affected it as much then uh, I knew and it buckled me on my first curveball that I threw in, in, in a bullpen. And then I went and got surgery like the next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I found the box score for you. So top of the sixth inning, Giants and Padres, Giants in San Diego. Omar Vizquel singled. Okay, and then here's where it gets wild here. Ray Durham singled back to you. So it must have been like a swinging bunt or something that you couldn't make a play on. Walked yeah, very. Well, okay, I don't want to interrupt. I don't mean to interrupt you, yeah. but I remember it was a swinging bunt, and mm-hmm. I went to try to throw him out at first base, and I had to make an awkward throw, like with nothing behind it, you know, just all arm. <laughs> and I felt my elbow on that throw to first base so bad that I'm just like, I, that's where I think I did most of the damage, to be honest with you, was was on that throw. And it never felt good the rest of that inning. But yeah, it was a swing and bunt. Yeah, and then yeah. walked Barry Bonds. And then here's another swinging bunt. Moises Alou singled back to the pitcher is what it says in the box score. So yeah. there's two of them in that inning. So you just couldn't escape it. I mean, it's and then you struck out Matt Morris swinging the end of the inning. So there you go. The triple. Yeah, so I, sw- I struck him out, and I, and I remember looking up at the at the um, at the gun because mm-hmm. we had a we had a radar gun out in left left field. You, you could see it was on like the, a board that you could see how hard you threw. Because I said like as bad as my elbow hurts, I still feel like I can throw hard. It was weird. Like mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? It was like I still felt like I had velocity. It just hurt when I threw it, and especially after I let go of the pitch. So then I looked up there, and it was 93. And I came in the dugout and I told my pitching coach that I blew out my elbow. And he's like, your last pitch was 93. I go, I know. I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> and sure enough, I had a torn, torn ligament. Yeah. Um, it was unfortunate that inning didn't go. I couldn't get out of that inning, but it was inevitable. You know, my elbow was blown out. Yeah, that's insane. All right. So before we go, I have a few rapid fire questions for you. Um, some trivia about you. So this should be interesting. First one is who would this is, I mean, some of these are easy. So you're going to get these right away. Who is your first big league strikeout? Um, that was uh, Jacob Brumfield. Yes, that's correct. Um, most homers off of you with four. Probably Matt Williams. Yes. Most strikeout. Who do you, who have you gotten the most four strikeouts against this hitter? Jeff Bagwell. It's Raul Mondesi. Oh, Mondesi, yes. Yes. I could check Bagwell, right? Bagwell actually had uh, – we could check that right now. Ten. So, ten strike – you've gotten him ten times. Uh, you struck out Mondesi 13 times, not four. Thir- no, I was going to say, I think I think it was more than four. <laughs> yeah. It was I wasn't not- going to call you out on that in case I was wrong. Yeah, okay, Mondesi. But, but yeah, Bagwell had to be close. Mm-hmm. I just faced Mondesi a lot more being with, with the Dodgers. So who hit – or who – you had four home runs in your career. Who were the four that you hit him off of? We already touched on Clemens. Who were the other three? First was against Alex Fernandez, right? He played for the Marlins at the time. Uh, the next one was off of uh, Mike Johnson – or no, Vincente Padilla. Um, or my – yeah, and then uh, the, the, I hit a grand slam off of Mike Johnson with the Expos. God, these are too easy. Vincente Padilla, by the way, was, I mean, I caught him at the tail end. I mean, I would turn off the TV because I was just scared to look at him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very. Yeah, that game, he had thrown, uh, well, it was only, it was two outs in the third because I was the ninth hitter, uh, but he had thrown no hitter at that time. I hit the, I hit the solo shot off of him. I remember that. Yeah, I, was like, just... ah, bro, I, 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 I go, not only I hit a home run, I broke up the no no. Yeah, there you go. One guy that I would not want to look at and find in a dark alley. Like, I mean, no, no. Yeah. So funniest teammate. Um, well, Mark Sweeney was a teammate of mine with the Padres and the Rockies. Uh, funny guy. Uh Giants funniest teammate. Um, I wouldn't say like just I would probably say Kirk Reader, just because he was just goofy. I think more goofy than anything. Sweeney was just flat out, like could be a stand-up comedian funny, but, uh, but Woody was just goofy funny and, and just a guy to have a lot of fun with. Last one here. This is a question that a lot of people kind of use variants of here. Would you rather be a long man in a bullpen that wins three championships or would you rather be a first ballot hall of famer? Hmm. Um, and, and, and did that Hall of Famer win any championships? No, no championships, no championships. Um, I take the three championships, absolutely. 
nothing better. I always say like, there's not nothing better. I, mean, I never won one, but there's nothing better. The, the reason why we play the game obviously is because you love the game of baseball and I love the competition of going out and pitching and competing, but I played on uh, good teams, you know, where I wasn't very good. And I played on bad teams where I was really good. And I would rather be on the good team where I wasn't very good. I, they're just the, yes, like you like to contribute. Obviously you'd like to be really good on a good team um, if that worked out, but I'd just the fun that you have as a group. Um, if it's just the memories you have on those teams where you win, they, 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 they can't really, not they can really make up for that. I mean, that, those are the memories you have. And so, um, to be really good on a bad team, yeah, you did good, but like, what are you going to say? Oh, I had a good year, big deal. But as a team, we stunk and it, there wasn't a lot of memories to that year, you know, other than some games I pitched. So that, that to me, what it's, what's, what it's all about. Yeah, so you would pick the the team championship reunions opposed to going to Cooperstown. I'd be, I'd, yeah, I'd rather be the uh, Yasmero Petit rather yeah. than the, uh, you know, rather than the uh, Ken Griffey Juniors. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sean Estes, John, I appreciate you joining me. This was a lot of fun. Um, it was great. What are you up to now? So what's what's next for you? Anything coming up in terms of you know NBC Sports? When do you when do you get going? Yeah, opening day. I'll be uh, in San Francisco doing pre and post Giants versus Mariners come April one. Um, so that's that's the plan right now, and um, I'll hopefully be doing some broadcasts uh, when Kruko takes some time off. Um, Javier Lopez and I will be back in the booth with Kipe at some point. Uh, we don't quite know the schedule for that and when those games are going to take place, but um, that's in the that's in the makings. But um, yeah, April 1, I'll enjoy some spring training games before then. But, yeah, looking forward to the season and I'm um, looking forward to see what the Giants can do in this division, which is which is going to be awfully tough this year. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for joining me, Sean. I appreciate it. All right, Steve. Yeah, my pleasure. You guys could follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at RizzoCast. You guys could follow me on Twitter at Steven Rizzotto. And uh, you guys, if I could pull it up real quick, Sean is also on Twitter. And you could find him at i should have had this ready at s estes 55 so there you go that's where you could find him all right thank you guys for listening thank you guys for watching subscribe wherever you're at we're building continually and have a great day